that's the classroom portion, then there's all the other stuff you have to do at night. But you have an opportunity, you know, protect your sleep, watch your sleep, make sure you get it. Um, and come back to this, you notice I said refresh it the next morning. That's when you're going to have the most opportunity to make sure that it's actually stabilized in long-term memory. Now, actually, the more you repeat it, the better. So ideally, uh, as you repeat and rehearse it and take a note, you're actually reviewing it right there in the first 30 seconds. If you write something down, let's say it's a flashcard. You make a flashcard. Well, test yourself with that flashcard right now. Don't wait until the end of the chapter. Test yourself right now. It's fresh in your brain. Why don't you just kind of reinforce that memory trace right now? So then you refresh it then. You get to the end of the, the uh, section, refresh everything that you've gone through. That's your second review. And it's easy because it's still in your brain. Right? And then at the end of the chapter, review the whole thing. Great, go to bed, sleep, come back, review the whole chapter. A week later, go back to chapter one, review it again. Don't think, oh, well, that week's over. I can forget all of that stuff. Or trust that it's all in long-term memory. No, it's not. It'll start to fade the moment that you cease to refresh it. So you want to keep coming back to it. And the refresh rate is really important. And it becomes faster, by the way. When you first learn it, it might take you four hours to learn a chapter, to deeply learn it. And your first refresh, if you do it right after you read the chapter, maybe about half an hour. But if you wait five weeks, you have to reread the entire chapter and spend that four hours again. You've lost an opportunity. You're now actually wasting time. It's not time efficient to review five weeks later. It's time efficient to review right now, right after you learned it. Review it right then. And you'll find that you'll, you'll actually remember stuff better and you're, you won't have as much of a time crunch at the end. All right. Questions? Comments? I'm going to trip over this if I'm not careful. Uh, let me talk very briefly about multiple choice tests. I mentioned at the beginning that there's uh, both things you do in the test, but there's also things about how you study. And the key mistake that a lot of students make is that they think that uh, multiple choice tests test repetition definitions. And certainly some questions do, but it's very easy to write a multiple choice exam that tests elaboration. And how they do that is they make the question look tricky. So if you look at the question and you go, this is tricky. Well, it's probably tricky because it's forcing you to, to make sure, or they're testing you on whether you actually understand the relationship between these things. And so as you read them, you might notice that, well, these two are kind of similar, but they're slightly different. Memorization won't help you with that. When you memorize, if here's concept A and you memorize the definition, here's concept B and you memorize the definition, that's great. But there's a relationship between A and B. There's a connection. They're not standalone. And the only way you can compare them is through another concept. So I don't have off the top of my head a good paramedic example of this. But if you were studying economics, monopolistic competition and a monopoly. They both have the monopoly word in it, but they're actually very different. And the only reason you can tell the difference between a monopoly, monopolistic competition, and monopoly is to talk about things about number of sellers, number of buyers, uh, free, full free market. There's about 10 distinguishing uh, relationships that connect monopoly and monopolistic competition. Think any disease, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, they're kind of the same and they're kind of different. What do you think the instructor is going to test you on? Yeah, they're going to test you from the middle part here, the differences. They're not going to test you on the definition. In that case, would like a circle chart help, like the two circles? You bet, yeah. Any way that you can visualize the difference and list the differences or draw out the differences, absolutely. But notice here that what you're doing is you're not just memorizing this. You're not just memorizing this, you're looking at the connection, the similarities and differences, the causation. There might be a cause if this was how a particular pathophysiological pathway works. Then it's a sequence and there's a connection, positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops. How does that all fit together? It's the connection between. And it's really easy to write a multiple choice exam that tests you in, the, in between spaces. And if you, even worse, you have a hazy idea, you have the gist of this concept, and you have the gist of this concept, and they're both hazy, they'll overlap, 
That's where the test question is. You'll get confused. And that's where a lot of students see, oh, the question's nitpicky and tricky. It's little tiny details. Well, yeah, it's because it's where they're testing. Now, there are instructors in the room. Is this right? Am I making this up, or is this? This fits. So does that, I hope that talk, uh, talks a little bit about the multiple choice. I, there are some resources on the website. I won't go into strategies you can use right now, but you're welcome to come and talk to me. Uh, or go online about the in, the in the test room environment. Don't pick C when in doubt. Trust your own instinct better. You probably have more information in your brain than you think you do. Make your best guess. Uh, there's a whole bunch of research on whether you should go with your first guess or your second guess. Most of the time I say you're, if you really have a valid reason for changing the answer, do so. Because usually you've, you've detected something. There's a whole bunch of strategies about tech, take the questions out of sequence, start with the easy ones, do those first, save the harder ones for later. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the internet about that. And I, and I encourage you to go to our learning commons in our library, digital learning commons through the website. And there'll be links to uh, how to take multiple choice exams in there. Group studying, I've talked a little bit about that already. Um, practical learning. The only thing I'll say about practical learning really briefly uh, is that there is a tendency for students to try to memorize with words the practice components. And it is much more effective for most people to use a visualization immersive strategy inside your brain as you're learning a practical skill. So instead of making a list, now I shouldn't say instead of, because making a list of things that you're going to do in which order, that's a good idea, but it's verbal. These are what you're using when you're in practice. That doesn't mean that the verbal isn't important, because in the verbal you have the understanding and you have the repetition, you know what the things are. But when you start to apply the information, you really want to pull in your visual immersive centers so that you actually imagine in your brain that you're performing the skill. And if you are doing a practical and you get some feedback, and let's say you skipped a step, and this often happens, you get halfway through a code and you just lose it. You go, oh, I don't know, and then you start making stuff up. That's fine, that's okay. At the end though, when you get feedback, you messed this step, you did that out of order, don't just go, Oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Instructors don't want to hear their, your sorry. They want to know that you're redoing it. And the best way to do it is to take that moment, step back a bit, and in your imagination, go back through the code and reinsert the misstep. Don't just tell yourself verbally, oh, oh, don't forget to remember, don't forget the blah, blah, blah. You, gotta re you actually have to use your visualization center, your imagination, Go through the code just briefly. It doesn't have, like, don't think that this is going to be like perfect 3D and in color. It doesn't need to be that. It just needs to be, I did hit, did, 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 insert, did, 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 and run the code correctly all the way to get to the end. It might only take five seconds. And people will think you're weird because if other people don't know you're doing this, you're kind of standing there kind of like this. And you look like you're having like a little mini seizure. But what you're doing is you're actually rerunning the code in your brain. And then ideally, all right, I'm ready to go back and try it again and get your hands in it and run it again. But if you don't do the inner rehearsal before doing the physical, even if it's five seconds, you'll end up making the same mistake. Or you'll correct that mistake and forget a dozen other things that you didn't do. So before you redo it, do it in your imagination before you do it out here. And as you're learning something, you're preparing for something, again, tap into that mem uh, mem uh, the visual center. Imagine yourself doing it. Make sense? One word of caution. And I see this more a little later on, um, where you start to answer written test questions based on what you did on car. Same mistake in reverse. If you're being tested on a multiple choice exam, you're being tested on conceptual abstract knowing, not what you do with your hands. When you're tested on what you do with your hands, use your imagination. When you're tested on what you know verbally, use a verbal uh, recall strategy. Don't think, okay, what did I do in car on this? Because you'll probably uh, select an answer that is not actually, 
It's what you would actually do physically, but it's not actually answering the question, which is always about concept. Make sense? Maybe later on that'll make a little sense as you get through. But the basic idea here is train yourself for the environment in which you're getting tested. If you're getting tested on practice, use your imagination. If you're being tested on words, learn them by words, through words. Helpful. Great. I want to talk about, t oh my gosh, I'm right, really over time. And uh, it's after lunch and I can hear the stomachs growling. Um, let me talk very briefly about time management. Uh, in some ways, you guys don't need a lot of time management. <laughs> it's planned for you. Just give up your life. You're studying. Uh, but some basic kinds of principles can be very helpful, particularly around your weekends. Uh, so during the week, you might uh, be able to, to establish a routine where you might, uh, at the end of the day, go home and uh, pl uh, plan out what you're going to be reading and what you're going to be studying, and there's a nice sequence for that. But what happens on the weekend is quite often it's a kind of an open ticket. There's two blocks of 18 hours, what are you going to do with them? And if you try to list out, okay, from 10 o'clock on Saturday morning to 11 o'clock, I'm going to read chapter four, and I'm going to take about five, and then I need to eat. It takes me about 10 minutes to walk to the, to the kitchen, and about five minutes to make myself a sandwich, and uh, four minutes to eat it, and then I've got to have a walk. Way too detailed, you'll find that your, your Saturday will never go according to that. Uh, even your Monday to Friday will never go according to that because it's over detailed. Um, you can plan out blocks on the Saturday, but most of the time students find it's more helpful to have action lists. Lists of high priority, medium priority, and optional nice twos, and to work their way through the list. So this is called the dump and sift method, and I'll give you the, uh, what I call the extreme makeover edition of how to do this, you are welcome to choose a smaller renovation or not to do it at all if you're happy with your time management. But the extreme makeover edition is you take a piece of paper, you look at your calendar, you look at uh, your course syllabus, and you think in your head of all the things that you have to, should, could, want, have, must do, and you get it out of your head. Don't try to do this in your head. Remember, your brain has band brand bandwidth. If you put too much through your brain, it'll implode get it out of your brain and onto a piece of paper where you can see it. Academic, social, everything. Get your whole life down onto that piece of paper. Dump it out. Once you finish the dump, take a new sheet of paper and, and go through this and sift for the elements that are most critical for you to do. The things in the center of your target. And write, rewrite the list as an action list. You don't want a lot on here. Uh, again, layer it through so you might only pick five. Go do them. When the five are done, great. Go back to your dump list, pick another five. Do those. When you're done those five, go back to the dump list. Pick another five. Right? Start from that inner target and work your way out. But the key here is to get it out of your head and onto a piece of paper so you can see it. Otherwise, you'll often uh, get paral uh, paralysis. You think, oh my gosh, i got to do this, 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 and this. Your brain is now, it can't handle that. If you write it down, it's easier. It's still a little overwhelming because you look at all those things you have to do and it'll, it'll scare you. <laughs> but then you must take the next step, which is to sift through it. Okay, where do I want to start? First thing, second thing. Let me go get those things done first. All right? Then the third thing, the fourth thing. Notice that this is another version of the five-minute technique. Instead of thinking about the whole, think about the pieces. What's the first piece I could do? If you have a choice between two pieces and you don't know which one's more important, don't spend the next half hour trying to figure it out. You're wasting time. Pick one. Go do it. Doesn't matter. You pick the wrong one, so what? You want to get out of paralysis. If you're just sitting there humming and hawing, I don't know if I should do this or that, you're, you're burning time. Pick one. Go do it. You'll feel a lot better and you'll break procrastination and after it's over you go, okay, I should have done that other thing so I'm going to go do it now. And make sure you got breaks in there too. That's why I said this list is not just your academics, it's got to be other things that are going on in your life. Helpful? Sometimes you can go the A, B, C, one, two, three. Most of the time, time is precious, just pick the ones. You can do that if you want, but you, by the way, don't spend a lot of time on this because that's another version of procrastination. 
It's a time manager procrastinator. It's the person who makes the perfect list of all the things that they're going to do but never does it. Spend two hours, it's a beautiful list of all the things they won't do. That's another version of procrastination. <laughs> so so how's the, the question is, how do you cram if you're past uh, the point? Uh, and the reality is you will always cram, and, and there's strategic cramming, and then there's unhelpful cramming. Strategic cramming I would like to call intensive review. This is where you go back over all the essentials in an intensive way, and most of the time that's actually important. If the day before the exam you go, okay, I'm done, I'm not going to do any review, you may feel really happy about that, although part of your brain is probably gone, you should study, you should study. All right? but. Uh, it's actually not a good strategy. So you actually do want to be studying the night before an exam. But if you're studying stuff you don't know, you're in trouble. Remember I said when you put new information into your brain, the stuff that's already there gets impaired. For those of you from psychology, it's called retroactive interference. And, you, and if any of you have uh, done any sports, you've probably had this experience. I'm going to pick on tennis. So you know you have a coach and you're learning, and you got a good forehand smash. And then your coach comes along and says, your foot's in the wrong place. Put it two inches back. And so you do what the coach says, and now suddenly your forehand smash is awful. Any of you had that experience when you learned it? Yeah. That's because you're, try you're learning, you've changed it. You're learning something new, and while you're learning to put your foot there, this thing's fallen apart. It was great before, but now it's falling apart. And there's a reason for that. And after a while, you start to integrate the two. You reintegrate the two so that they match. And now you can do the forehand smash and the foot's in the right spot. And then the mean coach comes along and says, straighten your back, and then it all fall, falls apart again. Well, the, that experience in physical learning is also exactly what happens in mental learning. As you learn new things, things you already know fall apart until you reintegrate them. So if you're cramming by learning brand new things, you're falling apart, in a sense, the night before the exam. Your intensive review should be stuff that you already know that you're reinforcing those memory traces, not so the integration, the bringing it all together. Uh, if you have no choice and you haven't been studying for an entire month, do whatever you can. Uh, but uh, chances are, even if that's true, you actually probably know more than you think you know. A lot of times when I give this presentation at this stage, a lot of students say, Peter, why didn't you tell me this all this stuff at the beginning when I started the online portion? Any of you having those thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's been a waste. You've actually done, you've probably done a lot of the rehearsal and elaboration, and you just didn't even know you were doing it. Because if you learn, you rehearsed or elaborated it. And so if you've learned anything, you must have been doing those things. You might have been doing them unconsciously or unaware, but you were doing them. And so you want to be, uh, 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 go back to what you know when you cram. Intensive review is what I prefer over cram. Um, does that help? Sort of. Um, I'm really over time now. Is there anything out of this list or anything else? Stress? When we talk about stress, what out of this list would you like me to address uh, in the few minutes we have left, or other items? Stress is on the list. Is that stress and balance? Stress and balance. Yep. So balance is really often just sort of a, a time thing. Make sure you're not doing the procrastination version of balance; that it's actually a real thing. And I'd often suggest that you actually plan it, because if it's planned then you're pretty confident that it's not the procrastinated version of it. Uh, and you do need it or you'll burn out. Free time. You'll need free time where there is nothing that you've got planned to do. How much of it you need and when you need it is an individual thing. Some people take every Friday evening off. That's it. They're done. I've known students who take every second Saturday as an academic free holiday where they refuse to do any academics every second Saturday. That's their break day. Others insert it on a, on a daily basis. So uh, a particular time during the day, that's their free time. Free time's a human need the same way that sleep's a human need. If you don't give yourself sleep three days hence, you will have a psychotic break. You'll start to hallucinate. Uh, and if you don't give yourself free time, you'll burn out and you'll just stop studying. You'll wake up and go, I've had enough. All right? You don't want that. You need free time. You need time for yourself. 
find out how much you need, when you need it, how you want to do it. But it, it, I always say it is as academic free, no plan. No matter what you do, you cannot study during that time. So then you go and actually take a real break and, and honor it. Don't take that time thinking, oh, I should be studying. No. Set it up one hour every second Saturday, whatever it is for you. Set it, protect it, put the fence around it so that you do it. Uh, stress. So there's a whole workshop on stress I could probably give. Uh, some of the real basic things I've actually already mentioned around nutrition. A lot of people think that exercise is the best way to reduce your stress and exercise is important, but actually nutrition's more powerful influencer on stress responses than physical exercise. So if you're eating nothing but donuts and, and fried food, uh, you might have higher stress levels because of your diet, uh, even though you're out exercising. And you know, I can't explain all of the physiology of that, but you know, eat well, eat balanced, uh, drink lots of water so that you're flushing uh, your system. Dehydrated brains do not learn well. And as you've probably discovered already in your course, if you're thirsty, you're already too far dehydrated. By the time you actually feel thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So lots of water all the time. Uh, don't even just have a water bottle with you and just keep drinking. You end up going to the washroom all the time. But you know what? All of that's taken care of. So there's the physical component. Certainly, go in for some exercise. It doesn't need to be the two-hour marathon. It can be a walk outside. Get outside. Get some sun or some rain. Whatever it is, it's natural light. Get outside, get the light in your eye. And it's really, and then you, again, you might already know this from your course, um, natural light, at least an hour and a half of natural light is needed for adequate sleep regulation. If you do not, if you live in this room and you have no natural light at any time for more than an hour and a half, your sleep starts to become discombobulated. It's a technical term. You can look it up in your book. <laughs> Um, so when you're on break, hang out by a window. Even better, go outside for a walk. Again, as you walk, you're exercising. It's a very subtle exercise. Your blood starts to flow. As the blood starts to flow, your brain gets oxygenated. This is your muscle, so you want to take care of it. So just moving around, walking, going for a walk, going outside, coming back in, getting any kind of natural light, even if it comes with raindrops, even if it's the liquid sunshine. Um, you know, think about those things. If you have an exercise routine, there is a temptation under this balance to ditch it. Uh, if you can avoid ditching it, do so. Uh, but you may also cut back on it. You might modify it for a little while. But don't completely eliminate it. So if you play racquetball, you may not be able to play racquetball every day. But you know what? You could do it at least once a week. Then there's the, so that's sort of the physical side of the stress. There's the time management side of the stress, which I won't stress, no pun intended, but uh, it's about kind of trying to keep track of stuff and so that you know that you're on track or if you're off track, you know that you're off track rather than feeling like you're out of control because that's where a lot of the stress comes from. Constantly feeling, I don't know if I'm on, 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 I don't know if I'm doing this right. I don't know if I've got enough time. You want to know it because then once you know it, you can deal with it. If you don't know it, then you can't deal with it. Uh, but good time management um, can reduce a lot of stress. And uh, then there's the cognitive or thinking part. So there's lots of ways that you can stress yourself out just with this thing, worrying. And you know that you've got troubles with worrying if you start to worry that you worry too much. Because now you'll never stop. <laughs> Um, so if you have a worry brain or you have a catastrophizing brain, do you know what I mean by that? Brains love to go into the future and predict all sorts of catastrophes. Oh, I'm going to fail. What happens if I fail? Well, if I fail, then I'm a loser. If I'm a loser, well, then I can't get a job. If I can't get a job, I'm broke. If I'm broke, well, then I'm going to live on the street. And if I live on the street, I'm going to be one of those people that's pushing the shopping cart. Oh, my God. <laughs> Any of you had that kind of thought? <laughs> Stop your brain when that happens. Your brain is not your friend <laughs> uh, in that context. And the simplest thing to do is when you get on that treadmill, yell stop in your head. Don't do it out loud. It's actually better if you do it out loud. It'll interrupt the uh, 
thought process more if you actually go into a room and scream out stop. The problem is uh, that the instructors here will uh, call the ambulance and you'll be taken away. <laughs> Kidding. But yeah, but yell it in your head stop and then immediate that'll give you a disconnect from your thought train and go okay what's most important for me to do right now? Well to study. Go study. Go do what's most important. You can also thank your brain for all those unhelpful thoughts of what happens if you fail this class. Thank you, brain, for uh, reminding me of the, uh, the possibility, the remote possibility of what that might look like. Thank you, frontal lobes. That was, but not helpful. So just recognize your brain in that context is not your friend. Thank it and move on. Don't argue with it. If you argue with your brain, you're in trouble for lots of reasons. But most of the reasons is you'll lose. So if you try to convince yourself, oh, no, I'm going to be okay. No, I'm not. Okay. Sometimes this comes back to motivation. I should study, but I don't want to. I really should study, but I don't feel like it. Any of you had that kind of conversation in your brain? You'll never win. Thank your brain for uh, that conversation and move on to what's most important to you, which is probably whatever it is. Thank your brain. Pat it on its head and move on. That's very brief. Does that make sense? I mean, I could go into a lot longer on that, but that's sort of the thinky side of stress. All right, we're out of time. <coughs> Anything else? Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Uh, I truly hope that this was helpful. Maybe you could just spend two minutes and tell me what was helpful today. What are the things that if I come here again and do this, what are the things that stood out most? to you as being helpful or useful or real keepers? Okay, so the positive kind of, you know, you can do it, the action-oriented yeah. stuff. Perfect, great, thank you. Great, okay, so the study methods, great. And by the way, everything that I've shown you is on our website and you can uh, research on your own if you want more details on any of that. Okay, so sort of showing you how your brain works and, yeah. and what happens when it doesn't. Great. Uh, I like the highlighter a bit. It's like I don't because I would just like highlight everything. But all that's important is the textbook, right? So but breaking it down like that, it made sense. Okay, great. How many of you like that highlighter, the how to highlight properly? Awesome. Great. Uh, being able to identify our weaknesses and correct that. Yeah. Okay, so kind of look to yourself first to figure out what you need to do forward. Great, awesome, thank you. The understanding of short term to long term memory and how that actually sort of plays a role in how we use it and sort of like, yeah, a lot of people can be doing it and not knowing it, but then as you have like an action, it's a good place to be able to discover it. Great, okay, and how many of you share that you found that the uh, short term, long term memory diagram uh, explanation was really helpful? Awesome, great. Any other real keepers? Everything. Sorry? Everything. Everything. Well, the good news is it's all been captured on video, so you can uh, uh, replay this today as many times as you like, uh, put it on repeat and sleep, give you <laughs> nightmares. <laughs> thank you. Oh, one more. Oh, just figure if uh, you could leave your contact. Oh, so yes, thank you very much. So I'm going to do that right now. Uh, there are actually are business cards for me in the main office that if you ever want to contact me, you can. The easiest way to get a hold of me is by email. If you call me, uh, there's a good chance I won't be able to respond right away. That's my email address. Uh, again, I can meet with you over the telephone. So if you want to set up an appointment, I don't have any drop-in or anything like that. You've got to set an appointment. Uh, and I see your hand. Don't throw anything yet. I have uh, hours that are uh, PCP friendly in the sense that I start work at 7.30 every morning. And so between 7.45 and 8.15, I'm available for a telephone conversation. And I can also see and talk with you over lunch uh, as well. And if neither of those times work and you can only talk to me in the evening or the late afternoon, we can arrange that. But I prefer that you use the other times. Uh, you can also sometimes step out of class if you want to have a conversation with me. Uh, you can, uh, the instructors here are usually really good. Just say, you know what? Well, you can just say, I have, a con I have an appointment with Peter, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, get out, get out. Get go have the appointment, and that's usually not an issue, I hope. 
<laughs> um, and, uh, and again, there's a lot of stuff on our website. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and good luck.